When it comes to uh, accountability, accountability is more about teaching than it is about telling. This is a problem with a lot of religion. If all we ever have in our ears is tellers, it turns into a lot of noise. It's valuable, but it's not helpful. Stop lusting. You know, give generously. Stop messing up. Forgive your enemies. We're going to end up paralyzed, turning in circles right where we are, and probably filled with shame because everything in us intends to go in the right direction. We just don't know how to get there because we can't see the path. Trying to do something that we can't see how to do. Jesus says, here's what I want for you. When it comes to life with me, don't just be tellers. Don't just tell them where they're wrong. Don't just tell them what to do. Teach them how to walk step by step from here to there before they get off track. Teaching them, not just telling. But teaching them what, though? Good morning. Wow. Hey, good to see you. If you got a Bible, grab it and meet me in Matthew 28 today. Matthew 28, uh, this is part three of a series uh, through kind of the final words of Jesus to his followers. We called it Marked. The things that Jesus commissions them to mark their lives so that shows up on the surface of their life and shows uh, for all of the people that need to see their story. Uh, and so that's where we're going to be today. Matthew 28, as, uh, as you're turning there, would you help me say hey to my buddy Gabe? Yeah, hey Gabe. So uh, Gabe's a senior at SCS, one of uh, several hundred students that was here this week as a part of uh, Stampede. And uh, you're going to see a video in here, I'm sure, a little more about that uh, as we go. And let me just tell you, um, if you are one of those people that's a little bit cynical or pessimistic about the future of faith in the next generation, uh, you need to do yourself a favor and mark your calendar now to show up to Stampede next year. Uh, and show up and serve, or uh, show up and observe, or, or just come to the bridge uh, one of these Wednesday nights and let us know you're going to be there. And, and uh, we, we want to make sure that you get a chance to see uh, what's happening. And I just, here's what I promise you'll experience um, and what happened all week this week at Stampede. Um, so it was louder than you would probably prefer. Some of you. Um, it, it, you may love or, or hate the music. I don't know. Um, it smells a little weird um, in the building, uh, kind of everywhere in the building. Is this true? Yeah, it's true, just a little bit. So, um, and, and you will come away more fired up than you have ever been before about the future of people following Jesus in the next generation. Um, it is happening. And so, and um, in part because of Gabe and uh, some of his buddies, people just like this. So, uh, but here, here's the thing um, uh, with, with Gabe. Um, Gabe is also an answer to a really quiet prayer that I've been praying for the last uh, three or four years, uh, really since COVID made us all go home and um, kind of left the front section uh, empty. For the last three or four years, uh, as we've come back, I've begun to pray just kind of quietly that, that when those seats got filled, they would get filled with worshipers. And I, I started to hear a rumor just a few weeks ago that Gabe and one of his buddies had started kind of sneaking down towards the front, and they'd just go an inch at a time, you know, a row at a time. And then last week, I saw him sitting right there. And I uh, texted him afterwards, and I'm like, Thank, you have no idea what a big deal uh, that is to me. And he said, um, man, I'm, I'm just hoping that some other students follow. And I said, Gabe, I really don't care if any of the other students follow, uh, a whole church is going to follow and I'm so grateful that you're there. So uh, really, really grateful for Gabe, uh, you and your leadership and uh, your life. And that is not why you were up here today. Uh, in fact, Gabe has no idea why he's up here um, right now. 
Um, I want him to help me, but in order for Gabe to help me, you guys are going to have to help Gabe. And I need, this is an all play. If this is going to work, I need you to be willing to help, okay? From the front of the auditorium all the way to the back of the auditorium, uh, I need you guys to help um, us. Can we do that? Can you guys help Gabe? So, Gabe, I have this. I need you to put this on, <laughs> right, however you want. But, I mean, it has to be on your, over your eyes, right? Okay, how are we doing? Can you, can you still see? No. Yeah? No. Okay, good. Excellent. Leave it just like that. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, Gabe, I, so your, your seat is right back here. I want you to go ahead and go back to your seat. What? <laughs> well, hang on. They can help you. Okay, because they can see what you can't see. So here's what we need. Uh, actually, I'm going to spin them around a little bit. So doesn't know exactly. Where. Now, we're going to need all of you helping Gabe. This is a guy with his whole life in front of him, okay? Like his whole future. And this is a wee bit perilous. There is a ledge right here. So need you guys to help. Now, what are you doing? Okay. Here's what I need. I'm going to give you on the count to three. If you're in the back and you want to help, you're going to really have to project. If you're up front, you're going to have to help him as well. But I need everybody all play, all in, help Gabe get back to where he needs to go. You're going back to your seat. You ready, bro? Yeah. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. Let's help him. Come on. Okay, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, okay, go ahead. And you, you can take this off for a second. Um, that didn't go so well. No. <laughs> no. Can you tell me why? There's a lot of voices. A lot of voices, a lot of, a lot of noise. Yeah. Um, they, were, they were trying to help you. Yeah. Um, were, you were you trying to follow instructions? Trying to. Okay. Um, I, I kind of sold you real big to these people, um, <laughs> that you were the kind of people that was a person we could follow, but I saw you walking in circles and kind of standing in the same place. Okay, so that, that's okay. We're not going to shame him because this is a grace place. Um, <laughs> were you trying to follow their instructions, what they were telling you to do? Yeah. But, but the, the problem was the noise. What about some of the, the, Did you notice some of them were silent? Yeah, I did, did notice did that. Did you notice that? You could hear their silence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some of them were silent because they felt like they were trying to help. Yeah. Um, some of them were silent because they think my illustration's dumb. They had no intention of playing along. Anything that I invited them to do, this is kind of the life that I live. So that's how that, that's how that goes. Okay, did the silence help? Uh, I mean, you spun in circles and stayed in the same place. I guess not. Then no, it did not help at all. They thought they were being helpful, but the noise, the telling, the com nothing helped. Can we try again? Yeah. Okay. Need. Can you guys try again, maybe a little bit harder? Actually, um, before, before you do that, anybody in this room that you can trust? Anybody that you think you can trust? Yeah. Who? Cooper. Oh, Cooper. Okay. Come on up, Cooper. <laughs> Cooper's actually one of the, other, uh, the guys that was moving down front. Uh, so these guys are leading the way. Um, hopefully, they can lead the way together. This is risky. I got a lot riding on this illustration, Cooper. <laughs> okay, go ahead and put that back on. Okay, I need you guys to help him get where he needs to go from here. Okay, I need all play, everybody involved. Need, can you do this? Okay, Cooper, here are the instructions. You can't force him to do anything. Okay, okay? we got to spin you around. <laughs> all right, here we go. On your mark, get set. Can we help him? Let's go. Help him get where he needs to go. Come on, crowd. Help him. <laughs> don't, don't quit on him. All right, this is where it's getting a little bit dangerous. I don't know. If, go, you guys keep helping. I don't know if Gabe understands that it's a little bit dangerous here. This is pretty good. This is pretty good. <laughs> I want to let him get to the dangerous part. Here we go. Look at this. All right, the dangerous part's over. All right, we're going to trust that he can make it from there. Uh, go ahead and take that off, Gabe. Way to go. Will you guys tell Gabe thank you? Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Cooper, thank you. All right, so it, it is not a perfect illustration. I uh, hope it connects. Here's the point. We need people in our lives who love us enough, close enough, 
to show us the way in ways we can't see. We need people in our lives who love us enough, close enough, to show us the way in ways we can't see. Matthew 28, Jesus finds himself on the top of a mountain where he gave some final instructions to the men and women that had followed him for three and a half years. For three and a half years, they've lived life with Jesus, learned what life that's really life looks like with Jesus. And now as they stand on this mountain, he's going to co-mission them to do the things that he did when he ascends into heaven. And one by one in this passage, we're looking at the five marks that he said should move to the surface of our story so that we see them constantly and so that the people that we're placed near can see them as well. Here's what he says, Matthew 28, familiar passage, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So last week, we looked at the first of the five marks. Followers of Jesus are called to be missional. We said, this is good news. Wherever we are, wherever we're going, we don't have to talk God into moving. God's already in the move, on the move. He's always at work and he invites us to join him in his work as we're going wherever we are. Today, I want to look at the second mark of followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus are missional. The second one, it's everybody's favorite. They're also accountable. Which, depending on your church story or your life story, may mean a hundred different things to you. Some of them really good, some of them not good at all. Maybe a little bit like the Princess Bride moment, uh, to those of you that know the best movie of all time. <laughs> Remember the moment? I do not think that word means what you seem to think that it means. Whether you've got an inconceivable picture of what accountability is, you got an incomplete picture of what accountability is or a non-existent idea of accountability that shows up in your life, I want us to slow down and look at these words that Jesus gives to people who follow him and maybe all leave with a clear vision of what accountability is in the heart and the mind of Jesus and why every single one of us should want it in our life. Can we do that? Matthew 28, beginning in verse 20, look what he says. He says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So I highlighted three things there. You can underline them if you've got a Bible there. Uh, the first one is the word teaching. Notice Jesus doesn't say telling. When it comes to uh, accountability, accountability is more about teaching than it is about telling. You understand there's a difference between teaching and telling, right, teachers? And can we be honest? Uh, th this is a problem with a lot of religion, isn't it? Like Gabe had plenty of tellers out there. If all we ever have in our ears is tellers, it turns into a lot of noise. It's valuable, but it's not helpful. If all we do for each other, if all we ever have in our ears is the voice of tellers, stop lusting. You know, give generously. Stop messing up. Forgive your enemies. Right? Go back to your seat. But nobody comes close enough with us for the journey to patiently, kindly, in a trustworthy way, walk with us and teach us step by step how to go where we know we're called to go. We're going to end up paralyzed, turning in circles right where we are, and probably filled with shame because everything in us intends to go in the right direction. We just don't know how to get there because we can't see the path. Paralyzed and filled with shame, or we're going to fall off a ledge, trying to do something that we can't see how to do. Jesus says, here's what I want for you. Here's what I want from you in the lives of the people I've placed near you. When it comes to life with me, don't just be tellers. Don't just tell them where they're wrong. Don't just tell them what to do. Teach them how to walk step 
by step from here to there before they get off track, right? When I was first growing as a follower of Jesus, accountability meant sitting down with another person, usually another man, one-on-one, once a week, going through a checklist of questions, you know, five or ten questions about the five or six most obvious ledges in a guy's life like mine. And he'd walk through the questions, go through the checklist, and ask me if I'd fallen off the ledge in any of those areas. And then there was always a last question at the end of the checklist of questions. Some of you guys, you know what the last question was? Did you just lie to me about any of the previous questions? Remember that? Like as, as if somehow if I didn't, if I lied on the number three, I wasn't going to lie on the last one. I don't know how that works. But like, and, and look, I, I'm not totally lined up, up against the questions or the checklists, all right? But I do have some questions about them. Like we'll get to one of them in a minute. Who decided on the five or six? And why just those? But the bigger thing is related to this illustration. Like it is good for Gabe to have a friend who looks over the, the ledge and asks him if he's down there. But I think what Gabe would prefer along the way, what I would prefer along the way, is somebody who doesn't wait until I'm over the ledge and ask me if I went over last week. I'd rather have someone who loves me enough, close enough, to walk with me every step of the way to notice when I begin to drift so that I can stay on track to the place that both of us want me to go. Here's the beauty of Jesus' model, the breakdown of my illustration, okay? Jesus' assumption is not that you're the person that's blind in everything and you need to find somebody who's blind in nothing to walk alongside you. It's not the idea. The assumption of Jesus, actually the explicit assertion of Jesus, is that all of us have blind spots, but we're not all blind in the same spot. So we need each other to walk with each other close enough, love each other well enough to walk along. Side each of us as disciples and make a disciple, we should all assume that we both have eyes to see and need eyes to see. Which means we're always called to be together, both teaching and taught, but rarely simply told. Teaching them, not just telling. But teaching them what, though? That's the second thing that matters here in verse 20. Look at Matthew 28, verse 20 again. Jesus says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Notice he doesn't just say teaching them to understand. Teaching them to know. That can be a particular struggle in our tradition, can it? Some of you that have been in the Bible church for a really long time. If we're not careful, we can just come to this idea that what it looks like to follow Jesus is to be able to fill in all the right blanks with all the right answers all the time. The more that we can make sure that we have the right answer to all of the questions, not just the big questions, but also the secondary and tertiary questions, and we're on the right side of all of the things, we know all of the answers, if we go deep in our teaching and we have all the deep answers, then somehow we're following Jesus from there. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for content. I just don't think that's the primary goal of discipleship. At least I I, I hope not. My two Bible degrees in content have taught me that when you look through the life of the follower of Jesus, they almost never had the right answer to put in the blank as they followed Jesus along. Deep information without deep transformation will not form you into a follower of Jesus. It will form you into a Pharisee. Remember what Jesus said, John 5, 39? He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. Like, that's the goal. That's the end. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Is this why when it comes to community groups, we try to encourage you to double down on the passage that we talk about on a Sunday morning rather than just grabbing another book or another sermon together? Now, obviously, there are times and seasons and reasons to do that uh, from time to time, but most of the time, what we want to do together is sit with a passage and soak in it so that we see all the way through a passage to the specific intersection between God's Word and our life this week. Together and individually also with people that know us and are coming to know us more intimately. In fact, the the word that's translated obey here is a different word from the word behave. It's not teaching them to behave. It's actually more closely related to the idea of observing something. It has to do with looking carefully, teaching them to look really carefully. Pay attention to where we fix our attention. 
Write this if you're taking notes and then I'll build it out. Accountability is more about seeing than just not sinning. It's more about seeing than just not sinning. So uh, most of you know, a, a few weeks ago, the Freeland family took our annual summer road trip. And this year we went to Yellowstone National Park. Uh, we went with my mom and dad and also my brother and sister-in-law and their two kids. Everybody uh, together stayed at an Airbnb and went, spent all this time in the park. The very first day we got to the park uh, in, in Yellowstone, uh, the very first stop actually was what's called the Artist Paint Pots. Um, and uh, as a part of just seeing this really cool geological feature, it's these boiling pots of mud, like just mud holes that are boiling, and they're all different colors. They're spectacular. But you walk up this wood staircase up to an, a, a place where you can oversee a whole valley, and you see the mountains in the far distance, and you see the valley that's there, and these cool geological features. And we walk up there, and I'm looking at this, and I'm, just, I'm having a moment, you know? And I'm wanting to Jesus juke my kids into having this worship moment like I am and all of the kids around. So I'm like, hey, kids, look at this. And I turn around and look, and they're not looking at this. But all five of the kids are huddled around together taking a picture of something. And I walk over, I find out what they're doing, and all of them are huddled around taking pictures, not of the landscape, but of a big pile of bison dung that they'd found. <laughs> and in that moment, they announced that they'd made it their mission to find and photograph as many different varieties of scat as they could find in Yellowstone National Park. They hadn't even seen the, the artist paint pots. They hadn't seen the panorama because a picture of a pile of poo had occupied their attention. I'm like, kids, come check this out. I pull them away from the poo and pull them over the rail and I focus their eyes out and in unison, all of them go, whoa. And the mercy of God in that moment, as we look out over the landscape, right in the whoa moment, a giant bison comes walking across the valley and they almost missed it. They hadn't had someone who would help them pay attention to where they were fixing their attention. We need that too. It's amazing to me reading through the Gospels how little when it comes to Jesus' followers, how little time he spends with them on specific sin management and behavior modification. And that's crazy because he picked some pretty salty guys to follow him around all the time. He picked some fishermen, picked a tax collector, picked a zealot to follow him. He spends virtually no time cleaning up their language, cleaning up their jokes. He spends almost all of his time on the focus of their hearts because he realizes if he can fix their focus and focus their attention like the head of a horse, everything else comes along with that. It's like my kids discovered. The more you tune your eyes to see splendor, less likely you are to be consumed with scat. In his great commission, Jesus invites his followers to be people who see and who show others how to see the splendor, and things that we never would have seen on our own. That brings up the last thing, teaching them to observe. Teaching them to observe what? See what it says back there in Matthew 28, 20, one more time teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. It's one of those places that accountability goes wrong. Some of you have been the experience, had the experience of this, and we've got to be aware of it. It's, it's not teaching them to obey everything that you have commanded them. It's not teaching them to obey even everything the church has commanded them. This is why, not to keep coming back to community groups, but keep coming back to community groups, we tend to end our community groups and we invite you to end your community group every single week with a, a response to the question, I will, not response to you should. As we look at a passage and soak in a passage and get a specific thing that we begin to see in a passage that intersects with our life, we get a chance to say, in light of that, in response to that, I will, not you should. Okay, I'd be really good with you should statements in community group, especially with some of the people in our group. 
That's not the goal. It's not that they're looking more like my standard at my pace. It's that we're spurring us to look more like Jesus at his pace and using his list. I mean, that's my other problem with the behavior checklists we sometimes generate for accountability. It's not that I don't need some version of those four or five or six questions in my story on a regular basis. I do. Don't hear me saying that those aren't important questions. I want to avoid catastrophic failure on my walk. I also want to avoid the slow drift off a ledge. But I also want to embrace some other things, not just avoid them. There's far more to the life that Jesus offers than simply avoiding sin. The idea isn't that we get to the end of our life. We go to see Jesus and go, didn't do any of the really bad stuff. Whew, I survived. No catastrophic failure for me. I want to get to the end of my life as a follower of Jesus who's doing the things he did and get to the end of my life the way he got to the end of his, right? Father, I finished the work. I glorified your name. I showed who you are and I showed what you're like everywhere I put my feet. That's what we're after. It's not just the behaviors we avoid. It's presenting, what does Colossians 1 say? The whole self as complete in Christ. I need people that are asking me hard questions about the ditches and the ledges. But what was the last time somebody leaned on my life and said, hey, how's your joy this week? Are you walking with abundant wonder today and worship? Are you a good news kind of person? Are you living victoriously? Accountability is about living in Christ-centered abundance, not just in failure avoidance. So how do we pull that off? How do we see, how do we observe everything Jesus commanded and help others too. Can I teach you how to see everything Jesus commanded in the next five minutes or less? No, I cannot. But I can tease you with it a little bit. We can spend the rest of our lives journeying together, close enough, intentional enough, near enough, loving enough to walk together towards it. Can we do that step by step? As best as I can tell, Jesus gave his followers around 50 explicit commands. Now, obviously, his followers, inspired by the Spirit, came along uh, to, to clarify some of those and to give focus to some of those commands. Uh, but, but I think we can boil them down to about four buckets that those 50 commands fall into. If you want to check my work, you can read through the Gospel of Mark. It's Jesus' training manual through the mouth of Peter, through the scribe of Mark. See if this isn't what you see Jesus doing for the followers of him during his day from the very beginning to the very end, all the way along. My hunch is one of these four things represents your next step today. And maybe the next step of somebody that you're going to walk nearby this week who needs to take another step, needs someone who can see the way, to show the way, close enough, with enough love, to walk with them. First one is this, it's decide. Decide whose will do I want Think back to Gabe. He had to make that decision at the very beginning, didn't he? Nobody forced him to go anywhere. Nobody forced him to walk in a specific way. He had to declare a decision about the direction he was going to walk and whether or not he trusted his buddy or the voices of the crowd. Jesus, at the very beginning of his journey with his disciples, declared publicly through his baptism, this is the direction my life's going to go from here. And then all along the way with his followers, he invited them over and over and over, follow me. With every decision, every day, follow me. Comes to the decision about a question, whose will am I going to want? That applies to all kinds of decisions, all kinds of scenarios, what to walk towards and what to walk away from. At some point, there's a decision. It says, whose will do I want? And bluntly, that's the decision before some of us this morning what you've been wrestling with, what you've been holding on to or holding back from or hiding, whose will do you want? Who will you follow? That's decision one. 
The second is discern. Discern. What's the Father doing here? What's he doing within me? And what's he doing around me? Sometimes that's as simple as a black and white command in the Scripture. God explicitly says what he wants to do in you or through you, what he wants to mark you. But Jesus models this over and over and over as he walks, and you watch him do it through the Gospels. Watch him walk through a world full of noise and carve out space to tune into the voice of his Father. And on a routine basis and in every single moment, listening for the voice of the Father to discern what he does next. In fact, he says this pretty explicitly. They ask him, how do you decide whose needs to meet and when, where to go and why? He says, this is what I do. The Son only does what the Father is doing. So that's the question, what's the Father doing within you? What's the Father doing around you in the places that you go? You want it for some fun on your spiritual walk? Let me just challenge you. In fact, I dare you, start a day like this. And especially if you start a day reading the scriptures, before you open up the scriptures, just spend a moment and say, God, let me tune my ears to hear your voice. What are you doing here within me? Maybe at the very beginning of the day, and then you want some real fun, do it in every room you walk into. Look with eyes to see and a heart to respond to what the Father's doing in the room where you walk, wherever you go. Father, what are you doing around me, and how can I be a part of it from here? In a world of noise, you've got to carve out some space to tune your heart so that his voice is the one you hear and respond to with your next step. And then the third one is depend. What's going to get my weight? What's going to get my weight When you read through the Gospel of Mark, this is the primary question that Jesus is dealing with with these followers over and over and over. He's constantly calling them to do something that they know they can't do. Yeah, feed these people. Walk on this water. Go to this place and and proclaim this message. And over and over and over they say, I can't. And over and over and over, Jesus says, you're right. This is the life of following me. You must always do what you cannot do with what you do not have for the rest of your life. But here's the thing. As you walk with me, as you depend on me, as you place your weight on me, I can use you to do things that you never dreamed of. But you got to decide what's going to get the weight of your trust. On whom or on what will you depend? You saw earlier, it's one thing to decide to move. It's another thing when you begin to move with confidence that your steps are sure because you know the one that you're trusting as you go. Okay, the last one is this, direct. Where will I direct my steps from here? Where will I step from here? Not where will I end up. What's my next step? Remember, the invitation is to follow, not to arrive. Your arrival is up to him. The next step is an invitation for you. What will your next step be? And who will your next step be with from here? See, I can be the the guy that brings up the questions and the categories for us. I can't be close enough to all of us to encourage you personally to decide or discern or to trust as you take your next step. But somebody near you can be. In fact, I believe somebody near you is called by Jesus to be least in this passage, and that you are called by Jesus to be this for someone near you. Do you have people like that? Ideally, a whole community of people like that. If you don't, I I know you don't have time. I I, I know it's not convenient. Can I just give you a little exhortation in this? How far do you want to go in abundant life? I want to walk this really well. Better than a hobby. Better than my career. Better than even my physical health. And at various times, this is just me, I've made time and even invited others to speak into all of those areas of my life because I wanted to be good at that. I want to be good at this. Why wouldn't I commit to that? We try to make this kind of thing turnkey in community groups at Doxology. If you'll show up with the right heart and the right posture... If something else is a better fit for you to commit to at this point in your journey, commit to that if it brings you this. There's a method to the method, even if it's not always obvious in a community group here. If you don't have that, I've got a lot of confidence and a lot of conviction about what we're inviting you into. And I'd invite you into it too. 
if you don't have something like that someplace else. Connection card can help you with that. Folks in the Next Step Center can help you find one of those or even host one of those in your neighborhood. Whatever that is, that's the exhortation for Jesus. A lot of ledges in the world. A lot of noise in the world. Find people. Be people who love enough, close enough to show the way when the way's hard to see. Be people on mission as you're going who are accountable. Would you bow your head with me? It's possible this morning that you're ready for your first step as a follower of Jesus. And it's not something to do, it's something to depend on. Jesus wants a relationship with you to the point that he came to the earth to live among us, to live the perfect life, to die a sinner's traitor death on a cross and then to rise from the dead to offer you forgiveness and his presence and his power for every single step from here on out. And he invites you to receive it simply as a gift. And you can receive it right where you're sitting in this moment. And it's as simple as telling him, Lord, I have depended on a lot of people but I sense that I'm hearing your voice today saying this is the way, walk in it, and I'm putting my trust for this step in you for eternity, receiving the eternal life that you promise, the hope that you've given, and your presence in my life for everything else. Lord, for those, for us, who have put our dependence on you for eternal life, would you let us be people who walk this out towards abundant life? Would you let us be people who have and be people who are close enough with a heart that loves like your heart to walk with each other every step of the way, to avoid the ledges, but also to see the splendor of abundant life that's found abiding in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church slash connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.